Morning, morning monsters. Yeah, I know. I know, I'm on camera. I haven't done a camera show in a while. I partly just really enjoyed doing the whole VR chat. But I think one of the other main reasons I switched over was just setting up the green screen is a whole faff and not setting it up was nice. Apologies if the camera's too high or anything. I was thinking a lot about feature tracking and face tracking stuff. Because one of the things I have to say that doesn't bring the old virtual avatar to life as much is I'm not able to really emote as much. Like obviously you can do you can do hand gestures and stuff and you can get all that to drive animations, but it's really a set of canned responses. And I suppose that's the thing that was intriguing me because something that someone said to me yesterday about we were talking about the lip tracker that HTC, HTC has been teasing. It's, it's been in Devland for a while, it's been leaked in a few places, but they're officially teasing on the Twitter now, which is interesting to see. Interesting to see, because I really, really enjoy being on camera, mostly because, like, as I say, I can emote and I can express quite a bit. But anyway, the thing I was interested in was with the lip tracker and this face tracking stuff, the, the question a friend asked me was, oh, does this mean that we don't need visings anymore? And I said, no, we still need them with this lip tracker and things because of how they work. If you're not already familiar with how they work, it's it's a few stages. and. This is not my area of expertise. I have worked with these things and I have helped back in the day with some computer vision tracking stuff. But most of my computer vision tracking stuff has been high frequency, like tracking things like move controllers, which is a different process. Similar, very similar, a lot of overlap. But yeah, so like the, the sort of I say state of the art or common practice these days is to throw machine learning at the problem. The thing about machine learning is you have to break down everything to just a series of float inputs really. So what you have to do, like how many float numbers throw into this thing to make feature tracking work. And if you were to take a full colour image like this and you were to not do anything to it and feed it into a thing, it would be however many pixels times three because obviously there's red, green, blue. And then if you had depth information from a depth camera, you would throw that in and so it's four floats, right? But then realistically what we actually do is we tend to work with uh, luminosity images, so grayscale images, because most of the time they're actually better and they have most of the information we need. Mm. So what we do there is we get luminosity images and then the old school approach is just to downscale that to low resolution, so we work with a low resolution version. And then you would have, let's say you put it down to a 16 by 16 grid of luminosity pixels, then you would have 16 times 16 floats to feed into this thing. That's a very general AI approach, not very optimal. So what we tend to do then is we tend to, before we feed it into like the tracking brain or whatever, we would use more traditional feature tracking methods, usually very contrast based. I don't know if you've ever seen like the makeup that's used to defeat cameras or uh, facial tracking stuff. It's all about faking where contrast is because if you do any face tracking, like handwritten face tracking code, a lot of it's about looking for the darkness, the eyebrows and looking for that, that contrast there. Contrast under the nose and then under the chin and things like that. You build uh, you look for gradients basically, it's feature gradients is how a lot of this works. It's one of the reasons why long hair, glasses, a whole bunch of other stuff trips up these algorithms because they're, they're written very naively on a very small data set. So there's that. This chair is actually forcing me to have good posture. It's nice, I like it. Long story short, we would use these feature gradients. Often we would feed this stuff through an FPGA or specialized software, as I say, take the whole image, do it, break it down into a smaller set of numbers. We usually feature tracking points, things like where do we think the eyes are in the image, level of confidence, where do we think points are in the image, and yeah, take this basic data and then you feed that smaller set of data into a, a machine learning approach. And that tends to work. That tends to work. But rather than like converting those feature tracked points to like a bone mesh face thing. So if you go back to, I think there's a GDC talk on this. I'm not talking out of school. Yeah, there is a GDC talk on this. If you go back to PS3 days and you look at how the iPad's faces were done, and there was a few other characters at the time whose faces were done this way, it was this massive 
network of bones, whereas now the more common modern approach is to have a few bones for things like eyeballs, maybe some lip flap or ear control or something like that, or hair control. But then the bulk of it is shakies, which means authored facial expressions, which means you can't ever do something that wasn't designed into the model. It's an interesting problem. It's an interesting problem. Yeah, so most of these machine learning situations, they actually spit out like a confidence value of we think they're blinking their left eye at this value, we think they're sticking out their tongue at this value, or like elastic plastic elastic plastic of the face expression stuff but ultimately mapping it to a known set of facial expressions rather than going oh we think the corner of the mouth is here i'm trying to track where the corner of the mouth is and a lot of that is because like the way we do 3d models and things with and the way we build faces is that if I move my face like this and there's a lot of squishiness in it and there's a lot of soft deformation basically is what I'm saying uh, push and pull and stretch and things and to get that to get that information into a, a model of the face is, is difficult facial animations I think an area that's going to have a lot of development in the next 30 years maybe 20 It'll be interesting to see how long it takes us to, to nail it, but I think like our current methods are so inadequate. Yeah, it'll be interesting. It gets me back to the whole face tracking thing and expressiveness and whatnot. Yeah, I really just like talking to camera because like we were playing Valheim and I have I've had the magic mirror character set up. Let's see if I can actually get that. Do I want to muck about live on thing with this? Yeah, let's let's map muck about live with this. I don't know if this will actually work, by the way. So pardon my um, experimentation with you all. Pardon my experimentation with you all. But I'm going to experiment. Oh, okay, there it is. Is it? No, it hasn't been able to capture the camera because OBS is using the camera. Which is a whole nother actual series of problems. But yeah, I was using the Magic Mirror software to do uh, my VTubing avatar in the corner. Which, by the way, one of the nice things about that is it doesn't actually track everything. So you can actually look a little bit sleepy. Like at the moment I've woken up, so I look a little bit sleepy. I'm not wearing any makeup. I look like trash. But on the VTubing avatar, it doesn't track, which is, which is nice. It takes a lot of stress off. It takes a lot of stress off. It's one of the reasons I actually do doing it with avatar. But yeah, we were playing Valheim and I had the, the thing in the corner. And I just didn't think it added much to the experience, to be honest. It was okay when I'm in VR chat and I'm a bit more emotive and moving with my full body and things. But yeah, with VR chat, it didn't. Sorry, with Valheim, with a cool thing, I didn't think it really added much. It's like almost like mm, I probably would have been better with nothing on. It is interesting. I have been thinking about it a lot. I have been thinking about it a lot. And you know, it was P similar to a GIF. I don't know what you mean by P similar. Too similar? Pretty similar. Ah, it was pretty similar to a gift. There we go, gotcha. Yeah, yeah. I don't know I don't know how much it added. We're, we had some pretty I'm a little bit crushed I didn't actually do a face cam there, because we had some pretty groan worthy moments and some terrifying moments and stuff that I know that if my face was on stream there would have been a lot more uh, emotion, you know? And I think that's one of the things, is like people we have a lot of part, a huge part of our brain to process in faces. It is nice to have that input, to have a bit more detail. Yeah, but yeah, this is why I'm excited for the the next generation of headset stuff because I think it doesn't take much to take that to the next level. The Decker Gear is still the thing I'm pinning my hopes on, not because I think it's got like any great amazing tech and it's more that it's an entire package and the fact that they have integrated the the upper face and lower face tracking because it's not just eye tracking they've actually because they're using a camera on the the face upper face and the other side and then a downwards facing the camera on the lips they can capture things like the eyebrows and stuff which is useful and very useful and saying it's actually even more interesting when you talk about things like the gallia and stuff where they have actually put it one sec i'll grab it they've put So, in here, this faceplate snaps off, and in the galley, so, yeah, faceplate snaps off. 
in the Gallia, uh, which is nice for cleaning. I actually need to go onto VR covers and get more. I want to see if I can get a more comfortable face paint. Because this one at the top of my head hurts a little bit. Okay, so that's actually really interesting there. Oh my god, that's a fucked up. That's just a fucked up image. <laughs> look like some demented cyber witch. But yeah, so there's a camera on the deck again that's sort of in here. That's, that's basically capturing what you can see inside there. Obviously the eyebrow movement will be limited, but a bit more eye tracking stuff and blinking stuff. The VR cover things really just to cushion the top here. But the interesting thing about the Gallia and, the, and some other stuff is this is actually a really good place to embed sensors because if I do things with my eyes, move my face about, there's a lot of, I know Goldham needs a hero, there's a lot of movement that happens on there. So you can actually pick up quite a bit there and using sensors on the skin. Uh, remember how I say you have to blow break everything down into floats? That's a signal that breaks down into maybe one or two floats quite nicely. Also love, by the way, that this is magnetic. Best part of that. Let me put this back down so I don't run over the cable. I do not want to run over the cable with my chair. That would be a problem. So anyway, yeah, the two cameras, and like I said, RGB is useless. So what they do is they actually put in a Lumo camera, like a, a luminosity camera. So it's just basically grayscale is another way of saying it. Because a grayscale sensor, purpose built, is much better. It means there's less uh, data going through the actual camera, so you're not doing it in software. Also, those cameras that you tend to want to use for this thing, this sort of work, you want very high frequency cameras. So like this webcam, craps out at like 60 fps and at 60 fps it's like pushing it whereas a good tracking camera sort of the low bar is 120 but realistically you're looking anywhere from 200 to 2000 5000 hertz usually around the 200 to 500 hertz range for a lot of the cheaper ones but 200 hertz for example is a huge improvement because it means you're for every frame that you're rendering because say you're rendering at 60 frames a second and you've got like a 240 hertz camera you're getting four frames out of that camera for every render frame and that gives you just a higher fidelity image it smooths out the noise but then also on board inside the actual camera like actually inside the camera there is a small bit of hardware to process what we call motion vectors ironically the reason motion vectors are in cameras and the reason why they've been there for the longest time is um, encode it's really interesting instead of taking a bitmap image every frame and saving that which would be huge amounts of information for video what we do first is we compress it down to something like JPEG and then you get like a motion JPEG where every single image is a frame uh, but it's still pretty big. So then what we do is we put in we put in interpolation frames, either I frames or B frames. B frames are just bi-directional interpolation frames where basically what we take is we take the existing image, like my hand here, and instead of encoding all of the entire image again, we literally say these pixels moved in this direction. And that's how most video encoding works. There's a lot more in depth we could go into it. But because of this, for the longest time, because these these camera companies didn't want to put really comp powerful computer chips in it, they worked out a way in the actual camera sensor package to, in to include motion vectors. Because motion vectors are one of the key things you need for video encoding. As a side effect of that, the early computer vision research work we did, we used to grab these motion vectors and we used them in our tracking data because we were like, why in software do really hard math to, to figure out these things when they've already been done by a very purpose-built piece of silicon? Because getting a CPU to do the same job is just not efficient. Motion vectors became a big deal, but now with tracking cameras, the motion vectors are purpose-built for those and you can actually get some tracking cameras where the onboard silicon gives you a bit more complex motion vector. There's some, there's some pretty cool sensor packages in development out there. If you want to play with them, you can. there's a lot of Arduino cameras and stuff you can get, which are handy. So why am I saying all this? Because lip tracking and visors, that's where we started in facial expressions and we are trying to... Yeah, I think we're going to be limited to visors for the most part for a while. But I don't think you're going to be able to do that sort of tongue thing. I think you will get some software 
where instead of rendering a traditional model, they might be doing some volumetric render stuff. But again, it will come down to like how much of this you want to push through like a generic API and how much of this you want to code specific hardware access. So the generic API is called OpenXR. And so the common thing is there's a company called Hypersense. They, I don't think they came up with this list of 48 channels or whatever it was. I think it was actually the Japanese creators who were working on dancing characters, VMC and all that, virtual motion controller. They came up with this sort of generic, here's your like 48 shape keys you care about or whatever. There's nothing stopping any individual piece of software coming up with its own list of shape keys, by the way. It's more just incompatible intercompatibility of content and assets and software and programs and things like that. Standardization is a powerful, powerful force. But if you were making a social VR app and you wanted to take this raw camera data and maybe do a volumetric face, I think you could probably do a volumetric face, very low res. Unless you purpose built some software to like reconstruct the Visemes, oh, but then you're back at Visemes land. Yeah, you could try take that low res and try and reconstruct a volumetric face from it. But that's a really interesting problem that you're into there. Yeah, I think long term we're going to get purpose built silicon for this stuff because it's going to be so common. But hey. It'll be an area of active development for I think a long time feature and stuff is going to be defined by pre-existing expressions. It was a big problem in computer animation actually. Yeah, immersive, immersive volumetric social stuff for meetings is interesting. It's something the enterprise space I think reaches for because they're a lot more comfortable with the idea of a very human face being shown. They don't want to have like furry avatars and anime characters running into meetings. Ironically, I think some of the best work's been done by those communities. I think the, the intense out there, crazy avatar stuff. I'm actually a lot more interested in the crazy avatar stuff expression, but yeah, I think the volumetric will, will have a huge appeal. There's the Cisco solution of face tracking that'll be very dull, but it'll work I think it's interesting actually if you go back even to one of the earliest instances of fiction in the space, Snow Crash, the thing that they identify there, which I think is one of the places where volumetric might win out, is one of the reasons why people like to have face-to-face -face meetings is if you develop that skill set of reading people and like basically playing poker and stuff in business meetings, it's helpful. If you're trying to sign if you're trying to sign a multi-million dollar contract, it's worth you getting on a private jet or a commercial flight or whatever and flying to whatever place and having a face-to-face -face meeting if you can negotiate that extra 5% or that extra 2% or whatever it is. Anyway, in Snow Crash, the reference they use there is businessmen really liking the high fidelity avatar stuff because it allows them to control the interaction more. So yeah, the moment it becomes, much like we've seen a hyper-optimization in networking architecture through real-time trading on Wall Street, and basically because there's a financial incentive to write these algorithms to be ridiculously fast because of its actual money and provable thing. If it becomes a thing where enterprise can provably make more money by having better facial capture technology or better facial animation technology, then I think we'll see rapid innovation in the space. At the moment, the people pushing on the problem other than just geeks and fans are Hollywood virtual productions are pushing hard. Oh, but that's what I was going to say was ironically, we had this problem in computer animation, whereas for the longest time, the riggers for a feature film or whatever would make the rig with a set of expressions and then the animators when they were actually coming to do the production were frustrated by the limited sort of expression work. If you go from like 2D animation where it's ultimate freedom, right? Every single frame you can smear the face, you can you can make the funny whatever, you know, like facial expression. No one had to think about it before that moment. So I think coming from 2D animation and frame by frame animation, we had ultimate freedom and then you went to this lockdown rig. People got very frustrated because they were like, but that's not the expression I want. I want the character to bend or stretch or whatever. 
and so a lot of pipelines a lot of the digital animation pipelines started introducing shakies but that was still not enough and so now if you look at a modern digital film you'll see there's a lot of basic blocking with predefined face shapes predefined shakies and things that they do but then they'll also go in and they'll they'll do like bespoke work for frames and stuff and of course that's not it's not practical at the moment for us to do that in real-time animation, but it's an interesting parallel to look at. Like whenever you want to see how to solve it potentially in real time in the future, and this is one of the reasons why SIGGRAPH has real time as a category when sometimes real time is like, it's a minute per frame. <laughs> because like soon in the future, a minute per frame could be, you know, done. And to be honest, that's not Moore's law or anything that usually cuts it down. It's usually just better math or purpose-built silicon. But yeah, anyway. That's going to be an interesting challenge. That's going to be a very interesting challenge because lip tracking, which is what we started this whole conversation on, and visims, because I, I don't know a single technical artist and I don't know a single artist doing like avatar commissions that enjoys doing visims. And a lot of them are actually quite lazy with the visims. I blame Japan on this again, actually. So one of the reasons why animation, lip tracking animation in Japan is not as big is they've done several studies that basically show that native Japanese speakers don't rely on lip reading as much whereas there's alternative studies for instance in English where there's certain words where you can play the exact same sound and based on which version of the image you show to an English speaker they'll hear two different words because in English we do a lot of um, lip rounding like wah and we do a lot of we do a lot more we just have more sounds in the expression but Beyond even having more sounds, we actually have some sounds that aren't, that don't sound that different, but we make a different face when we say them. So in Western animation, we have whole departments devoted to lip tracking, whereas in anime, we tend to go with lip flaps. And because a lot of VTubing and a lot of virtual avatar work has been driven by the Japanese development community, even when we've had more complex viasemes in certain software, the avatar creator community has basically put one or two visemes in and then tried to programmatically generate the others. When you look at like Clap Cat's Blender plugin, which is very popular for uh, VRChat creators, it has that problem where they generate a bunch of um, things. They don't get like the full range of expression. It's actually something that like the avatar I've been using, I, I need to do the hands and hair, that's top of the list. But um, I actually want to go in and, and tweak the visings because the base uh, I'm working with doesn't have the best set of visings. But it's also weird with that kind of character, like how do you do the ooh sound? And the, yeah, so anyway. But yeah, so visings, I think they're here, long story short, I think they're here to stay for a while, at least for real time applications. Deca Gear. Very, very interested in what they do. HSC's Lip Tracker will, I think, move the game forward a lot. But unless you're doing bespoke software like volumetric software, and even then, I think volumetric's going to have a rough time with the more standard specialized avatar stuff that we see. But yeah, it'll be interesting. It'll be interesting. It's been nice to chat about this stuff. And I'll see you when I see you. Bye bye now.